Hi, everybody. This is Agnesa from No Sediment, and welcome to No Sediment Podcast. Today, I am in Austria, Kamtal, and today my guest is Andreas Svikov, Master of Wine and Managing Director of Weingut Brundelmeier. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm telling you that you are my guest, but actually uh, we are your guests and uh, you are having us here in the middle of the harvest or towards the end. Towards the finale. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah. Thanks for coming. So um, if I'm not mistaken, you are one of the youngest Austrians to graduate Institute of Masters of Wine or the youngest? Uh, currently still the youngest, but uh, thankfully there is uh, one in the pipeline right now. Um, he passed both uh, theory and Practical in one go, which is amazing. And uh, if all goes well, he shall be graduating next year as then the youngest and the fourth Austrian. Um, all right. To get the uh, MW. All men. Yeah. Seems to me right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and again, one guy from Steiermark. So the steering power is there, of uh, course. <laughs> all right. Great. But how did you get into wine? Like at all in general? Um, in, in general, I think, uh, so my family doesn't own vineyards or we, do, we don't have a winery per se. Um, it was rather my uh, slightly older brother who got me a bit more interested into uh, the world of wine um, by uh, exposing me to not only the Austrian wines, but he was a sommelier in some of the top hotels and mm. uh, restaurants, both in Austria, but also abroad. And then he brought uh, some some interesting bottles back home and uh, and also the book uh, my first uh, real wine book was wine course from Francis Robinson who I dearly adore uh, and who has become somewhat an acquaintance now which uh, which I really um, love and enjoy and reading that this book together with um, uh, tasting some of the wines that he brought got, really got me more involved into um, into the world of wine and then uh, also a friend, now one of my best buddies, uh, who I went to college with, um, we met there, and he was, yeah, he's a he's a total wine freak, just as uh, I think I am, <laughs> and and everything accumulated, and and therefore here I am now uh, doing, um, ho- yeah, it looks like combining the passion with the profession, and that's very rare that you can do that, and so I'm, I'm very glad and happy to be where I am at this point. I can imagine. We are surrounded by beautiful wine. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And um, here also, you know, we we make um, a, an array of styles of wines, uh, starting from sparkling to dry still to dry uh, red. And if the vintage allows sweet. So mm. um, it's good. It's almost like um, going through the MW program in reality now. Oh, point. Point. Okay. I see that. Well, today's topic is terroir, which uh, I think is in some ways a philosophical topic and, and sometimes hard to grasp concept. But before we like start with that big topic, maybe you can tell um, us more about where we are, the Bangun Brundelmeier, the Kamtal, just so we kind of get the understanding. Yes, we're in Langenlois, which is sort of the bigger town of the Kamtal appellation. It's about one hour drive northwest of Vienna. Along the Danube, when you drive up uh, towards the northwest, uh, Krems is the bigger town close by. The Kamtal Appellation is basically known for dry white wine. So whenever you see Kamtal on a label, it can only be dry white wine made out of two grape varieties, one of which we shall be talking a bit more probably today. And uh, we are also a real great hub for sparkling wine traditional methods. So really started in 1989 making uh, uh, the first uh, base wine for uh, sect traditional method and uh, i will say that langenlois uh, looks like uh, yeah the central hub for grower sparkling wine uh, in austria we have some of the top five producers i guess of uh, sect uh, from coming from austria um, based here in langenlois and um, you get a refreshing uh, component from the northwestern uh, side, from the Bohemian Massif, uh, Waldviertel, Forest District is where we get the cooler influences. And this is slightly counteracted then by the eastern influence from the Pannonian side, so from uh, Hungary, from uh, uh, Burgenland. And they basically meet uh, sort of at the delta on the more of the eastern side of the Kamtal um, Appalachian. I think our wines are known here for 
uh, refreshing components, liveliness, uh, crisp elements, but then never lacking really in fruit concentration either. Um, balance, I think, is what Kamta wines um, are uh, looking like very, very often. And um, with the sites such as Heiligenstein, uh, Kieferberg, Lamm, Geisberg, um, Loiserberg, I think we have some of the greatest sites here in the Danube area. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and I think we will touch some of them. Well, hopefully. <laughs> But, okay, so if we move to the terroir, um, I want to ask you, what would you like, or how would you define terroir, or or how you see it? Because whenever you talk with people, each have their own definition for it. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, terroir is um, probably as often misused or abused as uh, minerality or um, uh, these, these uh, great character uh, nouns um, what we use for for me real sense of place wines so when uh, a style of wine is hardly interchangeable or is not interchangeable at all is where where i would recall this um yeah a style of a specific um, type of wine linked to a place um, then I think we can talk about terroir, and terroir can be influenced by many by many factors. You know, you have uh, the overall topography of a place, um, the proximity to waters, uh, lakes, oceans, uh, whatsoever. The climate obviously overall plays a role, and then you have macroclimate, uh, mesoclimate, and then going down to the vine itself by having the microclimate, the specific place. Terroir is often, however, uh, much more linked to soil in a way. I think soil plays a crucial part in um, how, what we can get out of a wine, but it's one part. It's not the only part. So all of this combined um, together with the hand of a person, mm. because uh, a human being, so from, from the start... From the, from the point where we plant a vine in there, there is a human influence. And if I exclude that completely, then um, I could talk about terroir in terms of, okay, this is what the overall geographical profile, climate profile, soil profile looks like, but it has to be interpreted by something and someone. So what you plant on a specific plot is then decided by a human being. So for me, there is a crucial part involved in when we call or when we say terroir is a, a woman or a man doing things to the specific place. I really like that. But you also kind of took away something that I was going to ask you next, um, but I will still do. Um, and you are right. When I read about terroir, so many people associate it directly with soil. Yes, they say there are other other influences, but they usually talk about uh, soil heaven uh, heavily. And then I wanted to ask you kind of a bit maybe controversial question, because if we are not cautious enough, we can drain our soil. Mm. And if we, you know, uh, wish to improve, we can also do that. Like if we wish to improve the soil, we can also do that. And so... Can we alter terroir oh. as a human beings doing this? You know, if we have a great terroir and we drain that soil and it's just, you know, it's gone, it's done, it has given everything it could, then there's no great terroir anymore. Or if we choose to add hummus or, you know, whatever to the soil and kind of don't till and stuff like that, we are kind of mm -hmm. preserving it. So can we as a human beings also alter the terroir in that way if we look specifically only on the soil. Mm. I, I think definitely we can alter or try to maintain the terroir okay. by um, applying certain things. If you if you bring out compost, if you, um, yeah, wh whatever method you use to work, to work the soil um, is probably um, trying to maintain the character in a way. Because, you know, terroir or you know, origin as such, uh, sense of place, has for me also a cultural and and and, uh, and historical uh, component to it. Because what what we think 
of a specific wine from a specific region had to be established for a, a certain period of time. So if we, if we take, um, let's say, a new movement of a specific style of a wine linked to an area, we, I, I couldn't talk about it as terroir just yet. So what that means is, I think, when you see an, a change in a way in terms of um, soil uh, um, character or you see that there is um, a poorer soil content now coming out or not enough water holding capacity of that soil, you're probably trying to maintain what used to be um, uh, 10 years ago or something. Yeah. It's just to try probably and maintain sort of a little bit the style um, and uh, the typicity or typicality of, uh, of that specific uh, place. So altering in one sense, altering the methods by hopefully maintaining what you already had uh, beforehand. And this is also here at our winery, we're trying to uh, practice that as, as good as possible because we know you know, we have a dry uh, area here, rather dry area, 500 to 600 millimeters uh, of rainfall per year. This is not very much. This also um, enables us maybe to uh, do organic uh, farming because the downy mildew pressure is not uh, as high. But given the fact that, yes, obviously we have ha higher temperatures now as opposed to 30 years ago, we need to have a look at the, uh, the the winds, like how how the evaporation takes place. Then we need to be more careful that the the water holding capacity of a specific place is adequate. And therefore, while probably beforehand we were mowing a little bit more frequently and mulching, we're now uh, trying to roll over only the uh, specific um, uh, grass and and. Um, our um, uh, our seeds and the plants that we that we bring in um, for in between the the vine rows. So, um, but we do that because we we want to maintain mm. a, a healthy soil in a way. Again, soil is one aspect. Of course, we need to be very careful with the soil, but there are many other factors like you know the canopy managements that you apply, what you do there. Um, leaf remo removal or not, um, are you having the bunches um, after uh, flowering or do you have a bigger crop on there? I think these are also all factors that eventually will determine what comes into the glass and, uh, and, not, um, and, and not only the soil character because we also know that, you know, with big research has been going on in terms for carbono or Dr. Richard Smart and some some other uh, really great people by actually not scientifically being able to prove that clearly the soil and what you get out of the soil is linked to the eventual style of a wine. It's hugely um, uh, challenging to to prove that because how many factors do you have in between? coming you know the grapes coming from a plant that's been set into uh, a, a specific soil and then eventually so many steps happen in between until the final alcoholic beverage comes into your um uh, into your glass so at the same time though we know that generally speaking wines that have uh, an origin with poorer soil content uh, might might have a greater uh, facet and character that that brings us to this term of terroir or a certain chalkiness or a, a saline component that we would associate with a you know with a distinct and quite pronounced sense of place character as opposed to richer soil types where you might have a little bit of a broader fruit profile that is more interchangeable from one place to another um, so yeah this this world of uh, terroir is, is quite vast and big and, and just uh, uh, still needs to be discovered even more. I think so. Yeah, I think I just off topic, I, I tried to do one essay for Masters of Wine training about terroir and at the end I just dropped it and I said I cannot, like I cannot do this because 
at the beginning where I wanted to define it. I just couldn't. You know, no, it, it just would be more like a dissertation, I would think, <laughs> not, not like an essay. Yeah. But you mentioned many factors uh, affecting uh, grapes, juice, wine. And I wanted to ask you, do you think terroir can be overpowered by winemaking? Yes, it can. It definitely can. Uh, with, um, you know, with so many different methods that you have now in place in the cellar to to change and change and alter uh, the the style of a wine you can definitely um cover the the sense of place from a specific origin at the same time you know i mean when we look at certain you know let's let's look at the, uh, uh, a classic uh cabernet from the napa valley um of course there's also a huger influence probably in the cellar by, you know, a bigger extraction method, by using uh, a decent amount of, uh, of oak, uh, élevage, um, longer, new oak, etc., that has an influence uh, basically into the final style of wine. But, but in a way, you know, they have been doing this for, again, for a specific period of time, for a longer period of time, and that link, links us this style to the specific type so so then we could say this is the the terroir of napa in a way with fortified wines we we know uh you know i mean there's a huge influence by by doing things in the cellar the way you know the the, the fortified wine comes out but that's part of the culture in a way it's part of you know how you make sherry and how you make ports um they have been doing this for decades and centuries and um, and of course has a huge influence on the final on the final product by what you do in the cellar. So it's always uh, um, yeah you know um, a plus and minus I guess I I will not say that the winemaking methods per se that you apply in um, uh, in the cellar are always negatively affecting your mm-hmm. your 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 final. Um, T- typical uh, wine from that specific place. Um, of course, over the the years, so many tools have been uh, introduced that you can use. You know, enzymes and you know uh, many different types of aroma yeast, and then you know um, al- alternatives to to the oak. Um, sure, you know normally you find these um, characters to be less linked to a specific place um, at the same time we need also probably to say um, some tools and some aids from the wine lab industry um, have probably also helped to to maintain a specific style of a wine coming from a specific area if we go back to the 60s and 70s I think there had been a lot more faulty wines compared to today. And so there's the question, is, does this actually um, uh, hinder m- me by, um, by, by having a, a, a clearer profile from a specific wine? Uh, it's always like in, in, just like in, in life, you know, it's all about the balance, I guess, of things. And if you apply certain methods adequately and properly and delicately, then I think you wouldn't change so much the sense of place in um, um, in in a wine, and you know one of the motherlands, uh, I guess from uh, from terroir Burgundy. Um, you can also say, you know, how how did the style of a white Burgundy that we know, a great Perrier Merceau or uh, something of that sort, there is an influence from a producer, of course. Like how how he presses, which press he use. He uses how dirty the juice comes into into a, a specific specific barrel, how much batonnage he applies or not. These are all tools, wine making tools that eventually create also the character of a uh, um, a specific VOD or a premier cru or a grand cru from uh, uh, from the Cote de Bon or Cote de Nuit. Yeah, I definitely uh, agree with you, and I think about that a lot because people say oh this wine was made by this beautiful terroir and yet when you get wine from the same terroir from a lesser producer somehow it is not as great anymore (laughs) yes they're absolutely right um 
So let's try to link terroir with grapes. Do you think there are other, uh, or do you think there are grapes that express terroir better than other? So yes, I do. Uh, and But then I guess we also have to put the factor of winemaking again in. So in that sense, I think the less interference and the less influence you will have from the seller, I think the the more expressive and the more precise you can really um, um, link uh, typicality of a wine to a, a place. Uh, and to this, uh, you know, in the white wine world, Riesling certainly pops right away into into my head because um, not many regions, not many producers will influence or interfere with the Riesling grape in the cellar as much as you would do, for example, with Chardonnay. You know, you hardly ever you have a malolactic fermentation being applied, hardly ever you do batonnage on a, uh, on a Riesling. Hardly ever you use new oak uh, for Riesling. I mean, yes, there are very, very few examples, but by far and large, you use neutrality in a way in the cellar for Riesling. So trying not to to influence the grape variety as such. And, and therefore, I, I strongly believe that Riesling is one of these varieties that shows uh, the sense of place the best and um, that you can somewhat clearly differentiate wines from the Mosul to the Rheingau, to the Nahe, to the Wachau, to the Kamtal, uh, to Alsace, um, to Franklin River uh, and Eden and Clare Valley in a way and then um so th then you hopefully feel the climate the influence of the waters the um the, the overall topography the aspect the soil obviously you know you have slate against volcanic sandstone um you have uh, to some extent clay here and there not so much but then you have uh, again a different s sort of um uh, 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 crystalline bedrock material so this for me is certainly my number one go-to in the white wine world. Chenin Blanc, I think, can, can go into, into a very, very similar direction. And, um, and of course, in, if we go back to Chardonnay, then I think the influence of the winemaking is just uh, substantially higher. We know that from, from Australia, you can get, you know, Burgundy replicates uh, really, really well done, really well done. Uh, but then this often has to do just how how they apply um, certain things in the cellar. I think, generally speaking, um, red wine. I think, yeah, Pinot certainly comes uh, comes uh, very very high up the ladder uh, as as a single varietal wine. Uh, certainly, the Bordeaux blends. I think should certainly uh, also be taken into consideration when we talk about terroir and then comparing. Um, uh, left bank versus right bank in Bordeaux versus you know many other great places that make including California including uh, um, uh, Australia um, or let's say Hawke's Bay uh, in, in New Zealand and I think you can get a certain um, typicality also out of these uh, uh, blends but but when we go back to Pinot Noir um, I think certainly that that can uh, show us very much where the wine comes from. Here again, what we haven't discussed before, and is like when the first influence of a person comes in, choosing the rootstock, choosing the clone, clonal material with Pinot Noir will certainly have an influence later on in the in the final in the final product. So, so in that sense. Um, uh, this variety is um, hugely uh, sensitive to to a specific place. You know, Nebbiolo hasn't um, been widespread uh, as much, but I think you know, Italian, northern Italian reds, or uh, from the volcanic uh, uh, places such as uh, uh, Etna, but also some uh, um, Balears uh, uh, islands. Um, I think they can also show this character, these specific varieties that you use in Real Mascalese or whatever. With your answer, you kind of scratched my next two questions out. Okay. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, because one of them was, why do you think Riesling would be 
uh, praised as the grape that uh, expresses its terroir so well, and you briefly touched it. Um, but maybe you have something to add. Sure. I think, histo- again, historically, I believe, you know, when we look at the, at the uh, books of um, the noble families and uh, uh, the, the queens and kings of the world, way before the Bordeaux classification of 1855, when probably these, for obviously reds, but um, when these wines came more into the luxurious world of, um, uh, of, uh, of the noble families and, and also of the church, is when way before we look, Mosul, the, the, the recings from the Mosul Valley um, have always been acclaimed as some of the, the, the most expensive wines in the world. When we look back into the um, 17th century um, and round about there. So I think there has, there's already a, an historic reason why um, uh, Riesling is, has such an originality in a way. Furthermore, of course, we then, th- this is a little bit linked to the cellar program. A classic Mosul Riesling is made probably also in the cellar a little bit differently to what we make here, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, but even so, by far and large, we make sort of the same um, st- st- things in the cellar compared Kamtal, Wachau, and and then uh, and then the Mosul Valley. Then I, I, I still believe that you can quickly get out um, the difference Mosul towards the the Austrian Appalachians due to this, you know, just really really steep terraces to to the slate that you have there due to the Mosul River influence, which we don't have as much here for instance with the Kamp river it's it's fairly small but uh, yeah i think this uh, this certainly adds adds to um the points where we say riesling can express the sense of place um extremely well and i think we see that also here with our with our wines um comparing a uh, rich steinmassel which is crystalline bedrock material paragnice versus a uh, red heiligenstein which is volcanic sandstone. When we do the same things here in the cellar, and we really do, um, we clearly see the difference in the glass. And and apart from what we have done in the vineyards, uh, but then you know you feel that great um, uh, difference between between these two sites. And that's that's you know the interpreter is riesling, but the origin is what speaks out very loud here and and i think that's that's something which is very exciting okay so if we now want to focus on brundelmeier experience um so you have vineyards in some of the top sites in kamtal both for gruner and riesling and with focus on riesling what do you do or maybe you don't do to allow terroir to shine in your wines Mm. well again i think um we uh when we go to the, the different Erste Lagen sites here, the classified uh, um, vineyards uh, of the Kamtal, we have a lot of men and w- women hours in per, per hectare in, in our vineyards, and that starts with pruning, and that will eventually influence already sort of, you know, the, um, first of all, the expected yields that you have, but then also how you frame out your canopy in a way. Because you know Riesling is a very sensitive grape variety and has uh, thin skins and is susceptible to rot fairly easily. You know, botrytis is something that we, for our dry wines, try to uh, refrain from. So therefore, we try not to um, have the grape work so much. So we 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 try to have a, an adequate yield, but never too much. Um, we we will depending on how the summer goes do more or less leaf removal as you know with Riesling it's a very sensitive subject um, uh, the TDN this character then uh, that can potentially then bring out the kerosene and and, and benzol uh, characters early on if it's sunburned if the skins from Riesling are sunburned so so we try to be as pragmatic and this um, uh, well-organized vintage after vintage um, in in the Riesling sites, uh, looking looking at the weather uh, conditions that we have uh, enough airflow going through. We have several vineyards um, on both Heiligenstein but also Steinmassel, these two Riesling sites that we train in Lyra training. 
So that brings us a little bit more photosynthesis, uh, probably a bit more even ripening in terms of uh, um, the, the fruit concentration and the must weight. Um, but also when uh, adverse weather conditions such as rainfall, camelol, uh, it normally can dry off also a little bit quicker because the wind can also blow within the canopy. Those are things that we try to apply for sensitive grapes, such as uh, wreathing, uh, more rigorously. We have, um, depending on where we are on the site like Steinmassel, really poor soil conditions. So we have very, very shallow topsoil and then right uh, starts the, the rock. So creating competition, especially water competition to the vines is something that we need to be very careful there. So trying to minimize that as much as possible. We probably spend just more hours within those sites compared to, let's say, the you know more richer, fertile uh, soil types where we have um, some of the Gruner Vetlinas uh, standing. Um, so, so I think this is why also this um, grape variety um, requires a bit more uh, attention to, d to detail in a way. It is funny that you're talking and saying that Riesling is such a sensitive grape, but then when you really read about it, you also read that it is relatively cold hardy. It lives in a, it, it doesn't mind the dryness in the, in the soils, like it's not as sensitive as other grapes. And then what I also find very interesting for this grape that we all praise so well, or so much in, in terms of expressing terroir, with relatively high yields, it can still retain high quality. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't mind also growing in these uh, kind of uh, richer soil types as well. So when you read about it, it kind of seems, you know, going against, like it is sensitive mm -hmm. and we keep talking about it. And it usually requires a lot of uh, manpower and it is an expensive grape. But then again, it is also kind of this sturdy grape in a way that yeah. can like produce a uh, good wine uh, with high yields as well so how like for me it seems almost kind of contradictory in a, in a way we could look at it that way but um uh, on on the other hand i think some of the uh, best reasons in the world are are clearly uh, made in a way where you you did a lot of effort um, within within the vineyard and then also uh, just trying to be very careful that this precise that crystalline characters uh, come out also to, through the vinification uh, side um, yes uh, hardy in a way in terms of um, cold resistance yes no problem uh, this is true um, in Adequate yields to some extent, yes, but a counter example would be, you know, how the Riesling um, had been diminuated by, you know, just blowing out so much Liebfrau milk and into, into the entire market. And, and it somewhat lost a little bit the exclusive exclusivity and, and mm -hmm. this, um, this real, you know, high quality character in a way. And, and that has to do with definitely high yields and, of course, what 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 Riesling can do is because it retains normally the acidity and the freshness quite well, um, and but brings out the aromatics also at a, at a higher um, you know a, a high yield category, um, but it's a little bit wishy washy then when when you don't do a proper job in uh, in in the vineyards and and that will be seen uh, in the long run fairly for me fairly quickly so. Um, but in terms of yield, yes, in you're, you're, you're right. We are also here at our winery not applying really halving the bunches uh, during uh, uh, or after flowering because um, we, we don't see a real need by decreasing the yield per se. But when you start with the pruning, we will already start with a, with a moderate minus um, uh, to expected yield in the racing world. And, and then um, also with um, uh, the, when we do the leaf removal and do the green uh, work in, uh, during the uh, spring and summer, we will make sure that there's certainly not a, a big yield in, uh, in these vineyards. But, but half in the bunches, what we do, for example, with the top sides of Grunewaldlina, 
because otherwise, you know, you get really big bunches of grapes. Um, we don't apply that too much uh, to Riesling, but uh, I will tell you that um, in in sites like Heiligenstein or, or Steinmassel, we have an average yield of anything between 30 hectoliters to maximum 35. For the old vines, it's 25. Very little for yeah. Riesling, I think. It is, it is very little for Riesling, but I also think then you get a true expression. You get a great concentration of fruit by also having this great fresh freshness mm -hmm. through the acidity. And all these key elements, what Riesling delivers will make it possible that Riesling can bring you some of the greatest wines in all of the categories. So by having a bone dry style Riesling without basically any residual sugar uh, to your dry Riesling, to your off dry Riesling, up to the great, you know, Trockenbeerners and, and, and the Sensor from this world. This is also why I think there's hardly any other grape in the world or there is no other white wine grape in the world that can do that. Chardonnay cannot bring that. It's not possible. Again, if we talk about this gr high quality in many styles, Chardonnay Blanc pops into my head. But the, but then but then you know the bracket gets really narrow or the group of of, of, of varieties. And so so therefore, we are certainly really big Riesling advocates. We we l dearly love the grape variety, and we can talk about it for a very long time. And uh, and try to express the different sites as uh, uh, much as possible by bringing them in separately, vinifying everything separately, is what we really love to do. Um, and in the end, at the same time, you know, we know that that we sell often more Gruner Vetlina or most of the time we sell more Gruner Vetlina than Riesling because it's just, yeah, it's still, you know, to uh, it's a, it is a sensitive grape and it's probably a grape that is not to be understood right away. I think you, you you can't you can't start with Riesling in your wine life uh, right right uh, right from the beginning, so therefore um, I think it's a, it's a grape variety that you uh, look for and look after um, year after year and see and find new uh, examples and say wow that's exciting and so I think that that is what what makes really very Riesling really very special. Your top vineyard, I think, for Riesling, if I'm not mistaken, is the Heiligenstein. Mm -hmm. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, Heiligenstein. Heiligenstein. Yeah. It is also, I think, one of the age-worthy wines. Like, you can age it almost forever. You know, Riesling is a great variety. You can age and then comes this terroir. Do you think the um, aging potential here in your wines also come from the terroir? Is it something that is uh, given by terroir as well? Or is it something that you specifically do in the in the vineyards the the, the people ageability is you you mentioned this i think is another factor why um riesling is such a high quality grape um but from an but age worthiness i can then also link to other to other terroir places in terms of places uh or um you know vineyards like kieferberg or lam i i know have uh, uh probably the same same capacity in a way. Again, I will, however, then need to go back to our interpreter in that sense, the grape variety. And and I will say that Riesling just has more, for me, more aging potential than, than Gruner Vatlina has. Yeah. Um, this has to do to some extent with the place, but I think here it's more the character of the vine itself that gives you the elements to have an age worthiness that is for uh, compared to s some other grape varieties such as Corona Valina, um just a little bit higher. So therefore, I um, I believe on one hand, yes, there is age worthiness for many of our places here, from also richer soil types, from the Spiegel Vineyard, for example, which is pureless. You know, it's a, a windblown sand deposit during the ice age here in our area. Or if we have um, Kieferberg, which is kind of a little bit of con conglomerate of uh, uh, gravel and then some a little clay island that you find there uh, too, so definitely richer, and they can they can age gracefully. I think, however, overall the um, the potential uh, for Riesling from Heiligenstein, for example, is just higher. Um, there is one the grape variety, but then there's also 
the this real very special site that you know we know have uh, has made uh, wines for centuries and centuries it's uh, it's our most historic um, site that we have here and for good reason we need of course to t take a little bit care about the climate changes that this specific vineyard will not become too hot and this is where again our soil management comes into place um, our leaf uh, and canopy management that needs to be changed in a, in a little bit and soil management goes link is linked with water management and if we however take care of this adequately i think we can still have a typicality of Heiligenstein that is then reminiscent of a Heiligenstein from the 70s and from the 80s. Yeah. And and that, in the way, is, is our goal. Mm. Okay. You touched climate change. So one question that I wanted to ask you, but we also maybe briefly touched it, is do you think that some terroirs are better suited for specific grapes? So And that would make grape part of the terroir, in a way. But then also... With the climate change, do you think that there could also be like there could be some terroir that are good now for Grunet, which maybe with climate becoming drier, you no, know, I don't know, hotter or whatever, uh, could later on be suited better for Riesling. You know, I I don't know, just kind of. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, a very good question, and and I think this has uh, come up now more recently. Uh, just I think in June, uh, a very good uh, journalist uh, from from Germany um, was doing an article on um, the the so-called one B sites, or you know the sites that have not had great status in the last or or twenty years ago, but which might have the potential to become really really good high quality sites. And one one of these sites for us is uh, the Loiserberg, which is a northwesterly. Mm. Um, play, fa placed um, uh, vineyard, uh, so it's the most northwesterly uh, erste lang site in the in the Kamtal. It's higher up altitude, of course, also makes uh, uh, makes a role. Um, so we are at around 450 meters at the at the top level there, and uh, this is nice. So it's crystal and bedrock, and we have only Grunewaldlina for the moment standing there. This brings out um, over the last years has brought out some really great, um, uh, good density and weight without, of course, losing freshness because it's still really rather cool up there. Um, as opposed to, you know, Lam on the other side, on the eastern side, certainly we there we have to be careful that the climate is not getting too hot. Um, more of the Pannonian influence is coming through here. It's about a 150 to 200 meters lower than uh, the Loiserberg uh, portion. Um, so, so yes, I mean there there will be to some extent uh, adjustments being made uh, for certain you know, either classifications or you know how you perceive a specific vineyard. Um, this vineyard back in the 70s did not bring out great wines because it was just too cold overall. Uh, so now we're at a stage where here, yes, we're fine, but on the then really good sides, we need just need to be careful that it doesn't become too wobbly, too rich, too uh, um, too powerful, that we lose a little bit of this balance and refreshing characters that um, our wines and the wines of the Kamtal generally are known for. So again, I think it is about adaptation and we are... Of course, not the only appellation in the world that will uh, need to look at this. I mean, many other, uh, including Burgundy, they have looked at uh, Syrah as a potential alternative. Um, yeah, it is a time where, you know, we can't say nothing's happening. Um, but at the same time, we also have seen, even in the last years here in our area, that you have vintages where you... Um, need to fight for ripeness. You know, mm. 22 was a vintage where uh, not all of our vineyards got as ripe as we would have wanted it to be. It doesn't mean right away that global warming right now is every year we have it warmer, every year the wines become richer. No, it's not like this. What we have seen, however, in the last 20 years is that the... Um, 
uh, repeated vintages where it has become warmer, a extreme weather situations. We just had this vintage uh, 23 where we on the 13th of September received a really bad hailstorm. You know, so late into the season, we were already picking. Um, we need to face these challenges and they, they have not been around as frequently as um, now uh, compared to the 80s, you know. Yeah, that's terrible. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, this is nature and we, we, ha we have to and, and love to work with nature, but... Um, but always hearing the 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 the, the, the uh, phrase to, to work in harmony together with nature, yes, it's a it's a nice uh, philosophical. But um, but sometimes nature is harsh to us because we are harsh to nature, and uh, um, we get the response from it. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't have much questions left, but I want to ask you still about the climate change. I've heard some people uh, believing or thinking that. What defines great terroir currently in our situation is that it can also mitigate the effects of global climate change, that it has the ability to kind of maybe mitigate it a bit, kind of soften its impact. Yeah, well, let's hope so. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, I would love uh, it that, that, that this is 100% proven. Um, what we see, I think, um, especially in Austria, is um, a, a very... Thankfully, a very organic and, and, and sustainable approach to um, to making wine and to um, uh, tending uh, the, or, or farming the land uh, uh, appropriately. It certainly has been become a m more fashionable to to work, you know, with less fertilizers and pe pe no pesticides, no herbicides. We have a really high percentage of organic and biodynamic farmland here and then you also see some secluded uh, wine regions uh, down south in Chile or um, you know uh, Tasmania that appear also to be working uh, very very close um, uh, to and, and with nature I still think uh, the only organic approach is not has not is become the real answer yet of of of, of um, mitigating uh, uh, climate change but um, you know what we have done now is not only looking at this um, approach to organic uh, farming since um, eight years now and you know Willy Brindelmeier has um, used the last time herbicides and pesticides in 79 so you know it's been it's been a quite quite a, a while uh, but I think one has to look at a holistic uh, approach uh, when when it comes to making wine. And one side is viticulture, one side is what you do out in the vineyard, but the other side is also what, what you do within your cellar. And when you have uh, an adequate size and a production where you, you know, um, you need quite a bit of energy, you need to look at the sources of energy um, installing uh, solar panels, um, you know, tractors. How can we potentially get rid of um, the classic tractors? This is still a way to go, but um, um, uh, the uh, electricity, the water, the water management, um, and so forth. I think when we look at all these factors together, socio-economic factors too. Then, then I think we're on we're on the right track. You know, I was just looking yesterday to our usage of uh, energy compared to last year, and we have saved, thankfully, already a, a really big amount of um, of energy thanks to our uh, new installations of photovoltaic systems. Um, it, we, I think, we have all just become a lot more aware of um, all these factors. Because uh, unfortunately, of what has been happening around in our world, you know, in in the crisis that we we are seeing at this at this stage, and that brings us to other uh, things less important to uh, than than wine is when uh, you know we need to be careful that we for the next generation we have um, hopefully a good a good living 
um, a good nature that is uh, that is out there, but also um, especially uh, a peaceful uh, environment. Um, and and currently, when you look uh, at this into the world, then you know wine becomes really very irrelevant. Um, but the good thing is that um, uh, these ir- irrelevant things should should enliven in you and enlighten you and and also give give hope. And I also truly believe that this such a cultural beverage as wine is uh, all, also can always bring uh, people together. Uh, you probably cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, stop wars, but uh, at least uh, uh, come that, that people talk again to each other. Maybe it's a uh, wine can also be a help there. Well, let's hope for that. Before we finish, I also wanted to touch a bit uh, on Austrian wines in general. Because I've been in love with Austrian wines for, I think, the longest time. Uh, and therefore, I've been following it quite closely also. You know, I kind of uh, maybe uh, seen how it developed. And the last time when I was in Austria, which was like two weeks ago or three weeks ago, uh, I catch, catch myself thinking, could it be that the Austrian wines, specific labels, are also entering the collectible and investment market? And uh, the specific uh, labels that came to my mind were the uh, the ones coming from uh, Franz Kitzberger and Ethics Spiegler in Wachau. And I wanted to uh, know your thoughts on mm-hmm. it. Because for sure, we think of Austrian wine as the top quality wine. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I could see the development going into a direction in the, last, in the next five to ten years where... Um, probably five to ten producers in, in Austria can certainly reach a a level where um you know collectors will will be looking for these wines uh, a bit more uh, actively we have seen in the last two to three years let's say ever since the pandemic started that uh, our wines have been also regarded as alternatives to really primarily fine white wine um, in in the global uh, wine market. Why is that? Uh, simply because other gr- regions uh, and appellations have just uh, increased their prices incredibly. Has one to do with uh, uh, scarcity uh, because, you know, Burgundy has had some vintages where they didn't produce so much at all. Second part would be probably that the demand for these wines has just uh, increased uh, continuously, you know. Um, so... So having said that, I, I firmly believe that uh, you will see uh, Austrian white wines, especially here from the Danube area, um, maybe some examples from Steiermark being uh, alternatives uh, in, in the fine wine market. Uh, we have also seen this, for example, with our Heiligenstein Alte, that, that there is a continuous uh, higher demand for, for these wines. Um, and even if we, all of us, also, thanks to the drastic inflation uh, uh, increase, uh, have have increased the prices for several of our wines, and we had to. Now, globally, these prices are still fine on the fine wine market. They are not. They're not enormously expensive. If I look uh, to our neighbors in Germany, I find substantially more three-digit prices. For um, uh, for GGs and uh, both white and red, um, and and for for us, you know, in Austria, you find very very few, even if that are three digits. So uh, in that sense, I st- I actually believe that we are a, a great value for money still in, when it comes to single vineyard critters, single vineyard uh, rieslings. Um, you have, you know, some some great Blaufränkisch from uh, uh, from the Burgenland area that that have uh, a price tag. Yes, they're not as well known yet, but they are definitely also on the radar of uh, the fine wine collectors. And then a couple things done from uh, Steiermark uh, single vineyard Sauvignons and uh, um, and and Chardonnays because they have also established a little bit their own identity. So yes, in that sense, <clears throat> we will also definitely see some increase in interest in in the fine wine market for Austria. I'm, I'm quite convinced. You know, when we look back uh, here and we see, uh, you know, 
uh, I dearly adore Grower Champagne, but we also see how these prices have increased massively over the over the last years. And I compare the quality of some of our uh, sparkling wines. I could also see some um, uh, some leeway there and some uh, open windows uh, for some grower sect from Austria that will uh, potentially uh, hit this market uh, sooner or later. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. I agree. But my my point of view was rather not about the price specifically, which of course matters, but more the scarcity, the quality, you know, and and because these things also drive the uh, the market in a way. And Austria is such a small winemaking country. The quality is so, so high. You can literally take these wines and forget about them in the cellar for 10 or 20 years. Right. So for me, I think that maybe because of that and because rest of the fine wine market is becoming so expensive that normal people, including myself, <laughs> I cannot afford Burgundy. And yeah, and so I was thinking maybe because of that, it's yeah. a great alternative and can enter uh, this, uh, this, this yeah. market and be part of the collectibles and, you know. All, um, all things are true, I think. And uh, again, just uh, repeating myself, I think over the last three years or so, we have felt this, that, you know, single vineyard designated wines um, that we sell to Japan uh, a bit more now to the US. We have had this uh, already for some time to the Scandinavian, uh, to the Scandinavian markets, etc. And that, that, that eventually all adds up uh, compared to, or when you win, as you say, rightly to the size of our wineries here, you know, I mean, we, we don't produce uh, hundreds of thousands of bottles of these fine wines. Uh, of these single vineyards, uh, and therefore, you know, you just um, allocate basically these wines, and uh, and that has happened more often, even if the overall global economic situation has not been that great. But we we see sincere interest, and I think this has to do also with the huge price increases from uh, from the other yeah. top appellations in the world. Yeah. Well, did you hear people <laughs> invest in Austrian wines? <laughs> For sure. Like I, I, I've seen uh, some of the wines that I cannot get, like, you know, the price is still fine, but like they're saying like, this is, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> and age worthiness is definitely there. Yeah. I mean, to a large extent, these wines can beautifully and gracefully age. Yeah. Yeah. But I have one more question left and that's something that I ask everyone uh, in this podcast. I want to know what is your wine myth that you would like to debunk? People believe that you... They say it's not true. I I would really love uh, to see what I touched on beforehand, uh, probably like like really linking or scientifically proving sort of like what what uh, makes a specific place uh, and and can I relate it scientifically to the final product? Ah, I think okay. that that would be something that um, if if we can prove this. Um, that that would be something that that would be really great. And the other thing, also somewhat in, linked to it, would be, um, you know, yeast is something that that is still such a big unknown world, um, and what they do and how clearly they might influence. You know, uh, we talk about spontaneous fermentation versus you know the cultured yeasts and like how they. Um, differentiate the style of a wine and, and to what extent they give certain things, certain characters to the final wine. There's still, I think, a lot to explore there and this is still sort of um, a, um, a cloud that is not, not uh, yeah. completely cleared up. Those would be two things that, I, that I'd love to see in the wine world at some point. But uh, yeah, so let's see if the R&P um, <laughs> teams are, are getting on this. Those are when we geeky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for having us here, for uh, sharing your time. Thanks for knowledge. having me. Well, I podcast. was, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, there's a small, small gift uh, from us, from our team, the no sediment. Very cool. When it's too cold or, you know, yeah. I don't know, we're in the vineyards. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I don't know, do you wear them, but, or maybe cycling. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>